Good evening and welcome to this evening's supervisor talk. Thanks all for coming this evening. And I'm really excited that Lauren Opal is with us today doing her presentation on um, private practice and success in private practice. I think that's a topic that is very important to be addressed and it can never be addressed enough and early enough. So I'm really excited that we have Lori with us this evening. We are recording and videotaping the event so that for students who can't be here this evening, they have an opportunity to still enjoy the presentation as well. So, Lori Opal is a marriage and family therapist and she views life as a spiral that is always moving us towards healing and wholeness. And from this perspective, the symptoms that bring us into therapy or consultation are not really problems, but the healing impulses of our psyche loudly declaring that our awareness and growth are required. Um, Lori is trained in EMDR and has expertise in trauma, depression, anxiety, self-esteem, relationship issues, couples therapy, and spiritual matters, and including spiritual emergence and emergency. And with her master's degree in East-West Psychology and Integral Counseling Psychology, Lori enjoys utilizing the rich wisdom traditions of the East. And she's available in San Francisco and Emeryville for psychotherapy consultation and supervision. So welcome, Lori. Thank you, Daniela. It's wonderful to be here tonight. And um, I've given this talk a number of times, both here at CIS and at uh, different ICCs. And part of my passion about offering this talk was that when I was in your seat, not that long ago, I started ICP in 93, um, and I was just remembering that I started my practicum in January of 94. Um, I was fortunate enough that I had some colleagues and friends that were just a little bit ahead of me, so I could pick their brain and ask them questions and say, what's next? What do I need to be thinking about? But there wasn't a lot that addressed it in the actual classes here at CIIS. And I feel like it's never too soon to start thinking about that, you know? Um, and let me just ask the question. I, I won't be able to address all of you individually, and there will be some time for some questions at the end that may be more specific to your needs. But does everyone here hope to someday have a private practice internship and then a private practice of their own? Is that something you aspire to? Is that true of everyone? It usually is. <laughs> Just like, how do you, how do you get there? <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> one of the things that I really like to start with is just some centering, because this topic actually can bring up a lot of anxiety for um, for people. And um, so. I'd just like to uh, remind you that part of um, part of our jobs as being therapists is dealing with our own anxiety and then coming up to our own edges and growing. And that's you've chosen a career where you're going to keep doing that the rest of your life. So that's both the good and bad news. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's just take a few minutes to go in. And I like to center in the heart and take a few deep breaths. And from this place, I want to offer you a poem. This is a translation from Daniel Ledinsky from St. John of the Cross. And it's called Development. Once I said to God, how do you teach us? And he replied, if you were playing chess with someone who had infinite power and infinite knowledge and wanted to make you a master of the game, where would all the chess pieces be at every moment? Indeed, not only where he wanted them, but where all were best for your development. And that is every situation of one's life. So 
so you can come back. So, um, I often find that poetry can offer medicine in these moments. And you all are in, on your path of professional development right now. It's, you, you're on it. And um, I really do feel like practicum, and actually the whole program, is a bit of a trial by fire that we go through. Get thrown into the deep end, figure out how to swim. So I like to normalize that a lot, because it doesn't necessarily get talked about. And um, I think that there can be shame or embarrassment around how challenging this task is that we've all been, I think most of us are called to it, to come put ourselves through the fire. I think it feels like you kind of have to be to hang in there because it's going to be so intense. Um, so <clears throat> I'm going to do, uh, while I'm talking, I'm going to model one of the edges, which is like how do you start developing your professional material, what does that look like, how do you get mailing lists, so I, I just have one copy because I'm almost out of one, but this is a newsletter that I put out twice a year with some other colleagues, so you can just peek at it, so if you actually want to get a hard copy, I need your real mailing address, and then you can also give me your email address, and then I'm hoping at some point to do some consultation groups, so let me know whether you'd like to be on my mailing list or have me let you know about that. So how many people are already in practicum? In practicum? In practicum, yeah. Oh, okay. About half of people. So how many people are yet to be in practicum? Is that the rest of you? Okay. Okay. And, um, okay. So one of the things I know about myself is as much as I have an outline and I try and get much more circular the way I work. So um, I hope you can bear with that. And there will be time for very specific questions. And the truth is, I really gave you everything right here. And um, some of the articles that I'm referencing are on my website under articles. There's a, the very first one is about setting yourself up for success in a private practice internship. I think that one's really important because a lot of people don't understand that it's actually starting your own business even though it's under the auspices of somebody else's license. So that really breaks down the nitty gritty stuff. And then I have another article on developmental tasks of a therapist, which are the edges that we're growing. You know, are, um, you know how to have compassion for ourselves, because we can only be exactly where we are. And then as we learn more and get more comfortable, usually more compassionate towards ourselves, things get easier. I will say, I don't think it ever, um, I'm continually humbled by sitting in the therapist chair. I feel like all my clients are my teachers and, and I am so honored. And um, I also feel like my uh, supervisees are my teachers as well. And it's a great journey to get to um, my goal as a supervisor is always to help someone become the best therapist they are. Like whatever their inherent gifts and skills are, I, I try and help them blossom into that. Um, so I'm a little different in that I don't have a sense of like, this is the right way to do it. And sometimes that means I'm not the best supervisor for some people. You know, if you really want nuts and bolts and tell me exactly what to say and do, that isn't my style. If I were to say how I work, it's more helping you get comfortable with not knowing. Because that a lot of times we don't know how to help our client, what to say next, you know. So, um, yeah. So, uh, one of my friends wrote his dissertation on the archetype of the mystic and the merchant. Now, all of us at CIS have some kind of spiritual inclination. That's why most of us you know, found, found our way here. And um, 
But there's often this kind of polarity of like, well, if I'm the healer archetype, I'm a therapist, but that business stuff. And I want to, you know, say we have to be able to hold it all, you know, the wholeness of it all. So part of that is thinking ahead about where you want to get to, and then figuring out what are the steps for you to get there. And there isn't one right way. But um, I'll back up and give you a little bit of my, my journey, just because most people are, are curious and, and that stuff. So um, practicum started in 94. I did it off-site um, at College of San Mateo. And I was there for two and a half years. And that it obviously is in San Mateo. And so I was like, well, I want to have a practice in San Francisco. I have a few clients that want to travel, be willing to travel, but you know, not a full practice. How do I make this happen? For me, the next step was finding a counseling center. And that happened to be New Perspectives Counseling Center. Um, the Marina is another very popular one here in the community, but there are many other nonprofits now. There, there are more and more. Um, but um, what that meant was a year of training and not having to market yourself yet, getting clients. Because that's one of the biggest challenges I think that we have. We're new at this, we're figuring it out. Honestly, at first we don't know what the hell we're doing. That's just the way it is. <laughs> and, um, but we're doing it, and we're figuring it out. But in order to market yourself, you have to sound like you know what you're doing. You have to have a language, too, for, for t that someone can resonate with, even to say, oh, that sounds like something I'm interested in. So that's where you'll see that some of the, um, the initial tasks that I see is the first big one is we have to manage our anxiety. It's, it's very anxiety provoking. You know, especially if someone is coming kind of like, fix me, help. Which, which is very often what uh, clients are coming. You know, that's, they're, they're suffering. So, um, so how do you deal with your own doubts and fears, your feelings of insecurity? Um, that's a big part of what we're figuring out when we're first um, in the chair. Um, I really think that one of the biggest jobs we have is building up our own loving kindness towards ourselves or compassion. Um, that that is really essential because as we are able to embody that more and more, that's part of what we're modeling for our clients. And a lot of our clients, one of the big issues is that they, they don't know how to love themselves. They have not been taught that. So um, that's where you know, the therapeutic experience can be a very healing space. Um, so I like, um, as you can tell, I like poetry. So one of the um, poems that to me gets right to the heart of the matter here is um, a Hafez quote. Not necessarily a poem, it's more prose. But um, someone asks Hafez, what is the sign of someone who knows God? Mm -hmm. And he says, he gets quiet for a while, and he says, My dear, they have dropped the knife. They have dropped the cruel knife that most so often use on their tender self and others. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of doing my bouncy, bouncing around thing, as you can tell, moving from this. So once I got to New Perspectives, I got valuable training. I'll say the, I think the most valuable thing I got there was a community. It was like a sangha. And some of my best friends and colleagues that today, you know, I call to consult with or, you know, um, came from that time frame. So that, that's something that's very important. Um, it's like your network. Uh, people that get to know how you work. Because we can't see every client, nor do we need to. And, but we do need to be able to make referrals that we feel confident about and comfortable with. Um, so it's really good to have people, and then they're going to be thinking of you, and it's this win-win. Um, and then I started cold calling. 
because I knew I wanted to be in a private practice internship. Of course, first I started with every teacher, every, everyone, fall, you know, I, I can't even tell you, but I literally got to cold calling. Um, and interviewed with a number of people and then found someone who was willing. I mean, that, that's what it, it takes, is finding someone that's willing and feels like a good fit. Um, and I'm a forever grateful to her for that. Um, and then, so that was about, I want to say 97. And then I was licensed in 99. So that's when I um, had my own private practice, June of 99. I've been supervising since 2002, private practice interns. And I also supervise for CIS and Perspectives. And I really love supervising, um, partially because it is different than doing therapy. Not I love doing therapy, but I like that I get to wear more hats and different hats, and I get to be a lot more transparent with my supervisees. Um, I definitely feel like I turn into business coach, mentor, you know, all the different um, possibilities. Um, <clears throat> so the, one of the things that, that is really important is, is that is listening to yourself and your own growing process because your psyche knows where your edges are, you know, whether it's in your own therapy or whether it's with your clients. You know where you're having a hard time and where you need help. Um, and I always feel so excited when my supervisees are able to share all of that with me you know, they think, uh-oh, I'm sharing this, this means something. And I'm like, yay, you're normal, and you're being able to ask for the help that you need with dealing with these really, you know, the most challenging part of this work. Um, so ultimately, I feel like we need to figure out what is our most authentic way of working and what our passion is. So at first, I think we often want to be able to say, oh, I can see everybody and work with everybody. And I think there's a value in that, especially in the beginning. You know, again, our clients are our teachers, so there's so much to learn from having a really wide cross-section. But after that, there's so many of us therapists out here. And I think we want to go towards what we really want and then put that out, so that we're actually getting the clients that we most want to work with, that we're the best at helping, you know? It, it, I think it's a win-win. But it does mean getting brave, you know, having that courage to say, this is what I like, or this is how I work, or, and it's true that it will turn some people away. There will be some people that won't resonate. I say that's fine. You know, that, that I say that then, you're working with the people that can most benefit from being with you. And I think that's a good thing. But um, there is a language that you have to develop over time because so much of this, um, at first we're just doing things and we're saying things and it's almost like later we can come back with a theory or a lens or, or, or make sense of why we did it. But in the moment, we may not even know, you know, and that, again, that's normal. But over time, I think, you know, what I see, because I have the privilege of being with people sometimes as they're seeing their very first client, starting practicum. Now, what you need there is different than what you need after you've been seeing clients for a year, two years, three years. Your edges grow, you know, what you're, what you're stretching into changes. So um, I love being able to help people at all the different places along the way. Um, so let's see. Um, I, I really love um, this quote about, um, and it feels like now is the time, about your vocation, the true vocation. And this comes from Frederick Buchner. The kind of work that, sorry, let me start over. The kind of work God usually calls you to 
is the kind of work you need most to do and that the world most needs to have done. The place God calls you to is a place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. So, um, one of the things I very much like to encourage with uh, supervisees is, is doing trainings. I'm sorry to say. Um, you don't get everything you need from school. Now, once you're licensed, it's already built in that you have to get CEUs. You know, you need to get 36 within two years, and I always get way more than that. And I love that, you know, lifelong learning really is a part of this career. But I do think that you actually need to start doing that whenever you see something that's like, wow, that's exciting. That calls to you. You know, one of my supervisees, it was clear she knew she wanted to work with eating disorders. And I said, oh, you know, JFK has this great certificate program. She got right on it. So that's how you start developing your niche. I mean, sometimes I have another supervisee where it just seemed to be that he had all these couples and he couldn't quite explain it, but that's what happened. And so then he did some training with Terrence Real and, you know, just finding different places, different resources. So, um, I think that that's really important. Um, I think it really helps you grow and, and develop more of the language and the ability to talk about these things. So I hope that isn't too much bad news. <laughs> um, so I talk about different, what I call, um, merchant-focused ideas. So this newsletter that I handed out is one of those building a website, having a place where your articles, if you write them, can be. Those are all kind of merchant-focused ways. These are your marketing materials, and you're going to want to be developing them over time. Even if you're at, um, I think more and more, even I'm thinking of Golden Gate, where you get a little blurb and your photo on, even when you're in practicum. So, you know, um, so much has changed since I started. You know, we were barely emailing. Then. And now I look at that part of what you have to develop in the culture now is more comfort with technology, is having a web presence, is having, having marketing materials that differentiate you from other people. So that's all part of it. And, and it's never too soon. You'll never regret starting that. Did you? Yeah, in terms of marketing um, and like branding yourself, where are places that you market? expose yourself to besides just word of mouth? It's a good, it's a good question, um, and the answer is going to be different for um, an intern versus when you have your, once you're licensed. You know, what you're able to do is a little different. Um, it depends on where you're at and what they're comfortable with. I have some uh, people that I work with, uh, new perspectives that have been on psychology today, you know, like that that's a, a thing that they added. Um, there are a lot of different web presences, you know, therapy, therapy, tribe. I mean, there, there's so many. And um, so it's figuring out which one resonates for you. Um, but, you know, one of the things that I've done more recently is I've done a Google Maps ad, and I'm definitely noticing a lot of traffic from that. Um, so let's see. Um, I feel like I'm not quite... Each time I do it, it's a little different. And, um, So, remember my focus is wanting to help you set yourself up for success. Now, what I can tell you is 
that there's this whole range. And wherever you are is just fine. Like, that's where you are. You can't be anywhere else, right? You can keep growing, and, and that's part of what kind of is required in the situation is to keep growing. But um, to, to be, to transition into a private practice internship, you really need to have clients, which, um, you know, means you need to be coming from someplace that you can bring some clients. Because there are expenses. And this is all broken down in that, art, that article on my website that I've highlighted. Um, so, you know, it, you, you call it supervisor's profit for the supervisor, but it's basically, usually people base it on a fee for supervision and a fee for how much office space you're using. And then there are other things like bookkeeping, your voicemail, malpractice, and blah, blah, blah. You can look it up if you want to look at it. But anyways, there's, there's expenses. So you need to have a client revenue that's going to be covering that. Now, here's where there's some fudge room. Because it used to be that you could pay for supervision out of pocket. But now they don't. The, the um, camp is not recommending it. There had been something with the labor board, blah, blah. That means that um, you need to be, have enough revenue to cover those expenses. You can be a volunteer in a private practice internship, which means someone can take you on, make sure that you're earning enough money, but once you become an employee, you need to be paying, you need to be paid minimum wage. So you need to think of that as an expense that you need to be making enough money to cover. Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> Um, I think you can understand that most supervisors can't afford to be investing in your business. Your business needs to be self-sufficient. It needs to be generating enough revenue to cover the expenses. So that, that's the bottom line of it. Um, so the way I've got... Yeah. Uh, what did you say about... Um not paying supervisors out of pocket? It, so it used to be that you, the clients pay for it. The, your revenue stream pays mm -hmm. for it. I get it, okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, checks are made out to your supervisor. You're not allowed to, no checks can get made out to you until you're licensed. Okay. So I usually have a separate account for each intern, so it's more clean that way. And, and then um, any, Expenses can come out of that, and supervisor's profit can come out of that. But but you're getting the sense that ideally you're not you're making enough so that all the expenses get paid for. And that's where I would say again it depends on your client load, but and and what they're paying. So those are some of the big variables. Um, but one of the big conversations I have when people are calling exploring whether we might be a fit is let's crunch the numbers. How many clients? You know, what's your monthly, in, you know, revenue stream? You know, like you have to look at it. This is the business part of it. So I'd say at least five clients is kind of a minimum. Again, it depends on what their fees are. So there can be a range. Five clients a week is yeah. a minimum? Yeah. Okay. Um, to give you, it, again, it depends a bit on how much office space is getting used, because that's the, the rent portion of the supervisor's profit. But um, I would say like a minimum, uh, just monthly uh, on that, is between six and 800. You know, to give you just a number, that's kind of a I'm still a little confused on the whole financial aspect. So then, say you have five clients, they're then writing a check to your supervisor, mm -hmm. or to you? To your supervisor. And then you're paying them as well if you have additional expenses? No. So this is why I'm saying you need enough client revenue generated here mm -hmm. to cover the expenses. Because otherwise you get into a situation where you're not making enough money to cover the rent, the supervision, and the other costs. And since legally you can't pay them out of pocket, and since then you're it, actually yes. going to pay them out of pocket. Now, I'm not... Uh, I don't... Then it sounds like like your supervisor is your bookkeeper, and then they're then they cut checks to 
pay your right. space. So and... I pay, I would never be the bookkeeper <laughs> myself. The only reason I'm able to supervise is that I hire a, a, you know, an agency that specializes in that. They do the payroll, it's $30 a month, you know. So that's another one of the expenses that goes into it. I think most supervisors would not be willing to take that on. Um, um, they help you with the workman's comp, you know, all these other pieces of being, because basically I've then become an employer. And, uh, you know, there are other implications and all that. How is that essentially different than something like a counseling center that you're kind of, can you just describe the differences and similarities? Maybe well, usually counseling centers are nonprofits. Some of them do training portions. Some don't. Um, so uh, there, there are, uh, I think, the same structure in terms that sometimes you may need to come on as a volunteer. You know, it varies from each place to each place, so I can't really speak in huge sweeping generalizations about nonprofits. Okay, you could speak to new perspective, because I'm a little unfamiliar with even how that kind of is working then. How, I'm, I'm not how, understanding the question. How a new perspective works in comparison to that, like being and having your own private practice as an inter uh, internship. So the difference that they have is they have definitely clients that come to you from their advertising and all of that. Mm -hmm. Whereas in a private practice situation, you're really landing and needing to advertise yourself. Like be ready to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what I'm trying to help people differentiate inside. Am I ready to do that? Mm -hmm. do, I, do I have enough clients? Am I generating enough revenue? Um, do I have enough of a like social network or collegial network that I'm going to get referrals or am I ready to take out ads? Because the other places, you'll get at least get some clients that way. Got it. Can you bring your own clients to a counseling center? Absolutely. Today? They're thrilled if you do. So it sounds like a counseling <laughs> center is more like uh, starting a, a landing pad and then you can go off. Yes. I mean, that's how I, that's how I used it. Right. Yes. And then one last question. When you said you were doing a cold calling, those are for clients? No, that was for finding a supervisor. For finding a supervisor. Yeah. Finding someone who's wow. willing to supervise me. Okay. Um, are, are you saying that um, there is no money to be made as a, as a private practice intern above minimum wage? No. It depends. So here's the thing. Um, each supervisor who has a private practice intern is the employer and gets to make all the decisions. They can do it any way they want. They could just pay you minimum wage. Um, the minimum wage part is the minimum that's required if you're an employee. Is that making sense? Mm -hmm. That's why I'm saying you have to think of that then as the payroll and as what the client revenue needs to be generated. In my situation, I considered whatever was left over after we paid any, you know, expenses. Like you can, you can, I, I let people write off their therapy, books, you know, whatever. If they, as long as we had a receipt, that could be pre-tax dollars. But um, then the rest would be a bonus. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I work at a counseling center that we take very low income clients. Yes. Um, or low key, it's like a scale. Um, can you say something about transitioning from that? It's challenging. It's challenging. This is probably the biggest conversation I have with my supervisees. Um, whether it's my private practice people or whether it's people looking at making that transition um, about raising fees. So you'll know that one of the things I say here is raise your client fees once a year. You know, start, you know, I recommend if you're at Church Street or wherever you are, practice. Because this is one of the harder conversations to have with your clients and it stirs up all your anxiety and all that, so, but it's actually one we need to get good at. And um, so even if it's, you know, $5 a year, it makes a difference. How, how low fee are? It goes down to 25. Okay. 
And does it kind of move you up so that eventually you're you're headed towards higher? Not not so. Yeah, it's a uh, sliding scale. Goes up to seventy five. Okay. And then we do reassess if the client's right. financial situation has changed. Exactly. So you are going to want to do that, and one of the conversations often that comes up. Um, so. I have private practice interns, and I'm, I'm actually at the point of starting a nonprofit so that I'll be able to supervise more interns. Um, so I'm in the process and not going to talk too much about it because it's like a new, it's like two newborn baby or something. I'm not quite ready to talk about it. But um, it's Prajna Psychotherapy Center, and, and it will mean that I can supervise more than two interns because that's one of the things about um, private practice internships is you can only supervise two. Um, but, so the big conversation when people are coming over is, this is kind of the, the suggested conversation. You know, I'm moving to a private practice internship, my expenses are going up, my fee structure is going to change, and this is where I'm headed. I like to be really gentle with clients, don't want any of them to have to, you know, for that to be the deal breaker for them, but also to let them know that eventually, and for each, um, Supervisee, I help them decide what is your what is your sliding scale. I don't set it for you. I help you set it for where you're at. So different people are at, at different places. Like I had two people that came to me from a counseling center where it was 50 to 90, and they were really comfortable with that. So that just seemed normal, right? To just go with that. And then they grew over time. So what starts happening is you start not sliding so low, and with newer clients, you, you know, that, that's just part of the evolution that starts happening over time. And especially as your practice grows. At first it feels like, you know, we just want the hours, and, and especially when we're not getting paid, you know, and that's why I try and bring the awareness that even if you aren't getting paid, technically, if these are the clients you're going to bring, you're going to want to have practiced and have these conversations and have them, you know, comfortable that, oh, once a year we talk about fees. That just happens. Whether or not they get raised or not, you know, so that's my encouragement because um, cause, cause it is one of the harder conversations. Is it not advised to bring clients with you that are not going to pay for themselves? Well, you know, it's tricky because you want your hours. Um, I had one of my interns crunch his numbers, and I think he came to that $30 was like break even for him right then. Um, with the amount of office space he had, blah, blah. So just knowing that would make, you know, like that's my break even. That's what it costs me to see a client. So your numbers may be different, but to know that I think is a really valuable thing right. to have figured that out because it helps you be able to have firmer boundaries. If you <laughs> and, and I think we all will make exceptions. You know, I know, I know, I, I definitely do much more with long-term clients than with brand new clients. Right? With brand new clients, it's much easier to kind of hold the boundary, refer them out if it, if it really isn't going to be a break-even. But if we're with someone and they're unemployed and whatever it is, you know, you want to hold a few places that you're willing, I call it pro bono work, you know. For me, that's seeing you guys as supervisees at, from CIS. That's my heart's giving back, you know. I'm, I'm breaking even, basically. But um, you want to have some spaces for that. But you can't have too many, not if you need to make a living, which I think we all do, right? It's a, you live in a very expensive place. So there's no shame in the fact that we need to make a living at this. That's, again, holding that merchant part and being able to hold that. You know, sometimes those are the conversations that really need to happen. You know, where a client, um, they want to make it about the money. And, and sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. Sometimes we can just, you know, really lean into it. Is it really about the money right there? Or is it about our, you know, or is it about the, our relationship and that sometimes it's awkward that there's this business element, you know? Um, you'll get pushed on your cancellation policies or, you know, whatever it is. You'll always be tested about where your boundaries are. 
Um, and they change over time, I can say that for sure. You know, there's this developmental evolutionary process that happens over time. That's definitely part of it. Um, so I'm, looking, I've, I'm doing great. Here, let me, let me go to the intern self-assessment part that's in that article on my um, website. So this is kind of some of the questions that if you were um, thinking about private practice that I would want you to answer for yourself. And then I also have questions for supervisors there because if, if you're exploring working with someone who hasn't supervised before, I'd recommend that you point that, that out to them because I think sometimes supervisors don't understand what they're getting themselves into and I like them to be educate, educated too. So, um, so, I, I, so here's the intern self-assessment. In addition to being a, an effective therapist, do you feel you have the entrepreneurial self-confidence and perseverance needed to initiate your own business? Do you, do you, are you ready? Are you like excited? You're going to be scared. Don't worry about that. That's normal. I wouldn't ever expect that to not be there. But are you, uh, are, are you up for it? Because if you aren't, go stay somewhere where you can ripen a little bit more, you know? Like, take care of yourself. This is a marathon. Don't just, you know, it's a marathon. You want to make it all the way through. So this is one I really highlight because I can't tell you the number of people I've seen get stuck behind the 500 hours for families, couples, or children. So think about where you're going to get those hours. Now, I'm sure you know that the first 150 that are uh, either couples or family, now you can count double. So that, that 150 can turn into 300, which is great. But if you're just, if you're in a private practice setting or even if you're at a counseling center, you know, three couples a week doesn't add up very fast. You know, it really takes a long time. So I've seen a number of my colleagues get stuck for years. I mean years. Just chipping away at those. So what I did was, at the when I was at uh, College of San Mateo, they had a sister school that was thrilled to have any help, and I saw kids for a year. And I saw 12 kids a week and I just plowed through them. And um, I love the work, but I also have to say it's not for everybody, and I cer it w certainly wasn't for me. You know, um, my heart felt like it got broken a lot more. And there's also the element that you often, you're working with the teacher, because I was on site at the school, you're working with the teachers, you're working with the parents, so you end up feeling like you have three clients instead of one. So it can get kind of complicated. So think about it. Figure out what that looks like. There are definitely uh, schools that are thrilled to have you. Um, and I will say I know of one person that got a paid internship. So it can happen, but um, you know I only know of one person, I'm sorry to say. So she was able to get those family hours and be paid. So it can happen. Okay. Do you have enough of a referral network already in place? So to me, that's the people that know you, know your work, and, and you already get a sense that they're going to, whenever they can, refer to you. Sometimes, and, yeah. With that, is that, you mentioned friends, teachers, like who else would you consider your reference base? Well, you know, the, the very best is when your clients refer other clients. Honestly, that's the very, very best. But it can be tricky because some clients don't want to share you. <laughs> um, uh, so that's, that's absolutely the best advertising that there is. And I, I personally, like, I don't want to be on Yelp and all that kind of stuff. I've heard some horror stories already from people about, you know, you can get great reviews and you can get horrific reviews because... You know, it's free speech and all that. So um, I think you want to be careful with, with some of that. But um, 
Yeah, I guess really for me it's my colleagues that have become my friends, you know, that we've traveled, that we're like, hey, I'm doing this uh, CEUs, come and join me, that kind of thing. Yeah. Or that I call when I'm like, help! <laughs> I need help holding this, because it still happens. It does. Okay. Here's another one. Does your life have adequate personal support in place to deal with the potential isolation of private practice? So, um, this is real. This is real. It can be shocking to people. Um, you know, I'm in a suite where I, there are six offices, and sometimes I don't even see my suite mates in a day. It can happen. Like, I'm there, we're both working, and, or maybe I see them as they're going to, from the bathroom, and that's it. So, it's, it's not the same as being at a counseling center, where there's kind of at least maybe some space or some time, or you know, group supervision, or something. So that's the place where often um, finding a consultation group that you like, or creating a peer um, support group. I, I, at that time, in my early on in my career, I did an EMDR group for six years, and that was one of the things that, um, so I was getting support on how to utilize this tool, but I was also getting, you know, bigger support as well. So those are the kinds of things that, like I want to say, invest in yourself. Invest in your self-care, because it is it is important. I, I really recommend being in therapy. I, you, you can't, uh, uh, I can't emphasize how much we learn from that experience. And at this point I can say, you know, having been in therapy for a long time, not, not continually, but you know, in and out and with different therapists, you know, there is this thing where a certain piece of work needs to happen, it happens, and then maybe you move to somebody else and there's something else that needs to happen. And there's just a way that from each therapist you learn something different. So, um, okay, here's another one. Um, do you have at least three strong professional references? Now that can be your supervisor, certainly can be um, a clinic director if you're at that site, but, and, and then, then usually one more. Um, when I'm interviewing people, I'll ask for three. I'll for sure want to have, talk to a, at least two. Um, and if I'm having questions, I'll, I'll want to talk to the third too. But you want people that know your work, can talk about that a little bit. Because that's really the lens that um, a private practice supervisor is going to want to hear. Um, my favorite question to, that I ask other supervisors is, um, what are their gifts and what are their growing edges? So those are great questions to ask yourself, too. So are you comfortable talking about how you work? And this is a big one. In, in the article where I talk about um, developmental tasks, you know, I feel like at first it's just, it's, we don't have words. Um, some, for some of us, we may have a real strong theory that pulls us, and, and that's great. So then it may be easier. Um, but most of us are somewhat eclectic in how we work. You know, we get pulled in different directions. Um, can, you can see my trajectory when you look on my bookshelf. <laughs> Can't say I've read them all, but you know, at some point that was the book I had to have. So, um, yeah. Okay, and, and do you have an area of specialization? What, you know, what is, what is your niche? Who is your favorite client to work with? great question. I mean, again, it's kind of a process. Um, I think that there are things that often happen where sometimes we choose our niche and sometimes our niche chooses us. So, it, or, or sometimes each way. So, um, you know, life experience, your own healing journey often has a lot to do with it. Um, and then just where you find the juice, 
you know, what kind of clients you find really that you get excited about. It, it's okay to love this work, too, I want to say. I, I think we need to. Because sometimes it can be really, some of it's really tough. So there, there does need to be passion and joy and, you know, so look for that. You know, a little bit of follow your bliss. So, um, so then the last question is, um, do you understand the work entailed in marketing and networking? You know, do, do you get it? Do you understand it? And I have to say, you know, it really, really, really has changed. My networking when I started in 99 consisted of twice a month going out with one of my favorite colleagues. And that was all I had to do. It has changed since then. <laughs> that, that wouldn't cut it. Although I still do make sure to do that because that's part of the self-care, you know. But um, it takes a lot more than that. When you say going out, do you mean just flyering? No, I mean going out to lunch. Oh. <laughs> that's what I did. Yeah. No, not flyering. So I think, you know, at this point it's much more uh, build a website, figure out what's working for you in terms of advertising, um, and you do get a sense, you know, um, and if you get just one client, it, it more than pays for itself, you know, any of them, you know, just one client. It, it, like you're, you're fine, and um, you know. So figure, figuring that out, I think flyering does still work, um, and, but it's about finding your kind of target client and where, how to get that to them. You know, what's the most expedient route to getting that information to them? So. Um, one of my ni my niches is around parenting and um, pregnancy and all of that, and I'm probably going to be advertising in Birth Ways, which is a, a online magazine, and uh, it's in the East Bay, over in the East Bay. But those are the kind of things where you can find places that are more specific to to the kind of clientele that you're working with. Um, so. It's, t it's 10 after, we have 20 more minutes. I want to open it up to your more specific questions, and then I have a poem to end with. So, um, I just want to again highlight that both articles that I've been pulling from are on my website under articles, and one is the private practice, setting yourself up for success, and the other is uh, therapist developmental tasks. Can you just actually speak out your website just in case oh, people yes, are yes. looking at this it's, video? It's uh, Lori Opal, L-O-R-I-O-P-A-L dot com. And my email is Lori at Lori Opal dot com. Like your last bullet point says, plan your timing for private practice carefully. I'm just wondering, did you cover that or is there anything else to add? Well, that's the thing about me wanting to help you you self-assess and that's where some of the questions that I just went over okay, you know ready. do you feel ready I mean and again that's highlighted with it'll always be a bit nerve-wracking you will be stretching past your comfort zone that's to be expected but are you you know I, I have had where it didn't work you know, with a private practice intern because there weren't enough, there's, it's normal for there to be some attrition over time with clients, and if you aren't kind of rejuvenating your practice, it can kind of die a slow death. So that's happened. And, and, and there are many factors that can, you know, come into that. But that's where it's like, try as best you can to choose a time when you are ready and able to kind of take that next step. Um, and if not, do you like stay at a counseling center if that's where you already are or an agency or somewhere like that? Like do people stay at those places for years? Well it depends on the it depends on the agency. A lot of them will allow you to stay through licensure. 
Yeah. So there, there, there are places like that, and there are more and more nonprofits, you know, that I'm going to be venturing into, which for me, mine won't be the level like the training and the clients because it's going to be something new. So I will be looking for people that are more ripe and ready for more a private practice model of a nonprofit, if that makes sense. So, so that's about figuring out where, where am I? Am I being realistic? Is now the time? Do I have the energy? You know, am I about to get married? Am I about to have a child? How, you know, how do you factor those things into the mix? It's complicated because life is, is, is complicated. Mm -hmm. Yes? So just to in the nonprofit that you're envisioning, mm -hmm. in, if you're providing maybe less training or maybe less source of clients, would that mean that you also take less of a portion than? I'm still in the process of figuring out. You know, I remember being an intern, and I want to make it very much a win win. And I thought I could do just what I've been doing for all these years, private practice, but just make it nonprofit, and I discovered I couldn't. So I'm trying to find the most win-win um, scenario that, that will work both for me and for the interns. Um, because we, it's realistic that you want to be able to make some money. You know, we all need to be able to make some money. How soon do you foresee doing a nonprofit? Starting to select the, the folks you know, uh, actually, one of my current private practice interns is going to be my first Prajna intern because she wants to be able to use office space that's off site, and that's one of the differences with a nonprofit is that you can rent office space elsewhere. With a private practice internship, you have to be within the same suite of offices right. as your supervisor. So, um, so that's happening. So. I, the answer is I don't. I don't really know. You know, I'm going to start there, and then it will it will grow hopefully. But you're welcome to reach out to me when your timing's right. It's that time. I'm oh. finishing three years at a, a counseling center, and I have. Like, yeah, it's it's that time. Okay. Yeah. Then call me. It's you know. I mean, I guess I have. I've left myself about five months to kind of make that transition, mm -hmm. but I feel like. And is, it, is there a firm cutoff of that you have to leave at that five-month point? In January is the other end. Okay. Okay. But I hope actually I could leave before then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you repeat what you said about the supervisor being in your same building? So if, um, if you're in a private practice internship, um, you're supposed to share the same office space as your supervisor. You can, as long as it's within the same suite of offices, mm -hmm. that's okay mm -hmm. as well. But that's one of the limitations. The two limitations are you can only have two, and it has to be within the same suite of offices. I was wondering, is there a time when it's too early to go into private practice internship in regards to your hours? Well, you have to have an intern number, so that's a big mm -hmm. thing. Because um, people don't realize that sometimes and are calling, and it's like, well, you need to have. So th that's a diff another difference. At a nonprofit or a counseling center, which are usually nonprofits, you don't. You can be a trainee. You don't have to have your intern number yet. Mm -hmm. But if you're going into private practice, you do need to have your intern number. You, you can't without that. So that is another difference. Um, but, you know, you're hearing me talk about the more overarching things in terms of your own inner confidence, the number of clients, the amount of revenue that you're generating. Those are all the things that you want to be looking at. And so it doesn't really matter if somebody is ready, whether they have another 1,500 hours or if they're down to just maybe another five to 800 hours. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. It's more the overarching of when they are ready and when it's their right timing. Yeah. Um, so I've had people come in at different places. And, and this is, again, where we don't want to judge ourselves or compare. 
because we're just at different places. You know, some people come to this as a second career. You know, some people have been in marketing before or public speaking or, you know, whatever it is. And, um, it, you know, they can really generate a client stream. And if you're not there yet and you jump in, you know, that sl slow death thing is not pleasant. As a supervisor, I don't like it. You know, that's why I'm trying to help you guys figure out you know, self-assess so that you're looking when you're really genuinely ready. Because um, that's the win-win um, for your clients, for you. Because it, it's not, it's very sad when you're closing a practice and having to refer clients out. That's, that's, a, that's a sad time for everybody. And I don't mean to be downer, but I, I, part of what I feel like I want to, I want to talk turkey. I want to be real. I want you guys to think about the business elements of it. I want you to have realistic expectations so that you are making the choices for yourself that are going to be of most benefit to you. Is there a, uh, like a, a number uh, that's like, I don't know, the standard for how many clients you should have to start this private practice internship? It's not hard or fast because it really can depend. If they're all $25 clients, you can see that that, if they're five, five, $25 clients, it's not enough. It's just not enough. So if they're, if they're five $90 clients, that's, no, that's a different story. That's gonna, it, it's just radically different. So that's where it's like you really need to look at your numbers. So it isn't so much the number of clients. I say five because, you know, uh, you know, there is one other thing I need to, I've forgotten to mention, which is I'm sure you're aware of the, of the change in supervisory hour rates for, you know, it used to be that you could do this big um, averaging, and now it's if you have 11 clients, you need two hours of supervision for that week. So that's another hidden expense, you know, in private practice internship, that if you reach that point, you know, what I talk to my interns about is, you want to make sure that's a full fee client so it can pay for your extra supervision. Because that's the difference. If it's a low fee client, you probably would want to say, I'm sorry my practice is full right now, I have a waiting list, I'll be happy to call you if things change. Now once you're over the 11 number and you need that supervision anyways, then you might get more flexible. But for that one that's going to take you over, you really would want that to be, you know, it, it just makes sense, right? Yes. In terms of like long-term financial planning, so like let's say you um, graduate from here from Pakistan and you maybe go to like the counseling center for a while and I, I've heard in some places that you don't get paid the first year and then so like, uh, or, or even maybe just if you went into private practice or internship, like I'm trying to figure out, do you basically get paid like nothing or minimum wage or maybe this little bit extra if you have a lot of clients and there's some overflow with the supervisor? So, it's so, it so varies. So, so here's the thing. I, you know, I, I've had volunteer private practice interns because there wasn't yet enough. One of the, my, my fudge points is uh, there'll be a volunteer and we'll start saving the money in the account and then when it seems like we're safe, then we can go. You know, like there's a net that if we ever reach that point of, uh-oh, I need an extra supervision, there's the extra money there. So just like a little bit of a cushion. So that's one of the ways of working around it. But, um, sorry, what was your question? I just well, so basically I'm trying to think about like, um, like once you graduate, how many years do you expect to be right. okay. here? So here's the, here's the range. So I'm saying from working for free, basically, to, you know, um, with a pretty full practice, I'm written checks for over $2,000, you know, to, to private practice interns. A month. A month. And it, it how many clients is that? That was, you know, that was before the supervision requirements had changed, but anyways, that was probably over 10, like 12 clients a week. Right, but so remember, that's already covering 
supervisor's profit, rent, you know, all those other expenses are already out and that was what was the remainder. But do you see how big of a span that is and that's, you know, I, I honestly don't know of very many people that are able to get through this process without some other form of support. And it isn't always, you know, whether it's family, a husband, or I don't know, student loans, or you know, just like you have to get creative because it is a long haul. And, or can you have, is there time to have like a, another job part-time? Sure, I definitely there? saw people that had other jobs. They often weren't in this field, you know, so they weren't getting hours, but they were getting um, their, their living expenses. So I actually should say that that is one of my questions that I ask my private practice interns is, like, do you have your living expenses covered? Because I actually feel like you need to not be relying on this for that initially because it can create this intense dynamic of needing your clients, and that's not good. I mean, we're holding the big picture, and we're holding that, yes, we do need to make money and that we are merchants, but that is never good for your clients or yourself because it's a level of fear that you're in that, I'm also assuming that when we're talking about like five clients, just as an example, mm -hmm. a week, we're talking about actually more clients because not every client comes every week. So right. that base is actually much bigger. It, it can be, you know, I mean, um, it's true that it's a rare week that every single client comes, but, um, but if you're, you want you want them to be coming as much as possible, and you want to be be holding that. But yeah, I've heard it said a few times that it takes about three years to have a thriving private practice. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that sounds about right? And if so, what is the definition of thriving? Does mm -hmm. that mean being able to more than break even, or is there something else to look forward to at the end of the tunnel? <laughs> Well, it's a great question, and again, there's this huge range, so I, there's, you know, I'm not trying to be evasive or anything. You know, part of, um, there are benefits for being self-employed. You know, one of the big benefits for me was that I got to really scale back my practice when my kids were really young, because I wanted to do attachment parenting, and that was crucial to me. And I could make those decisions. It did mean that I didn't have a thriving practice for a while, but that was, a choice I made, a life choice I made, you know, so that that's where you, there's all these different things to factor in. I have definitely seen practices take off in three years and be thriving, absolutely. But I think it depends on you, your energy, you know, part of this is can you sell yourself? Are you able to do the marketing? Are you willing to come and do something like this, right? I mean, this is this is it. You're looking at some of my my networking right now. So anything else? I guess part of what I want to say is it is totally possible. And it's a great privilege to get to do this work. I feel honored every day. So there's, there's intense rewards, and it's not easy. And it definitely takes, uh, you know, effort and figuring out what, what's working, what isn't working, what do I need to do differently, you know? So, anything else before I end with a poem? Um, I have a question, and it's not directed at you specifically, mm -hmm. but uh, around the model of supervising private internship, whatever, the thing you're talking about, um, what did you get out of it? What do I get out of it? Yeah. Um, I had a really amazing first supervisor, and I... I feel like she gave me one of the greatest gifts, and if I had to boil it down to what it was, is she taught me to trust myself and trust my clients. And to not get scared of the scary stuff that came up. And um, 
I love getting to give that gift back to my supervisees. And um, I love helping them find their bliss in this work or their niche or you know, take it to the next level or whatever it is. Um, I get a lot of a joy out of that. It really is, again, a great honor. Um, and the thing, <laughs> then the practical part about it is I get to rent my office space. Um, they don't cancel on me. <laughs> you know, there's, there's things like that. They come during the day. So there are ways that it is a win for me. You know, they, uh, I do slide. I'm not charging my full fee to my supervisees. You know, that's another way I try and give back as I can. Um, but I also charge a fee that I feel comfortable with. Like, I, at this point, I don't slide super low anymore. You know, like, so it's, it's, that, it's that middle ground. Does that answer? That's great. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. So, um, so this poem is, is a, a wonderful reminder. It's by Jim Cohn. You carry the cure within you. Everything that comes your way is blessed. The Creator gives you one more day. Stand on the neck of fearful mind. Do not wait to open your heart. Let yourself go into the mystery. Sometimes the threads have no weave. The price for not loving yourself is high. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.